People can laugh at almost anything. What's the deal with that? What makes something funny? This essay reviews some theories of what it is for something to be funny. Each theory offers insights into this question, but no single approach provides a comprehensive answer. According to the superiority theory of humor, funniness results from feeling superior to another person or the former version of ourselves, and we laugh at them. Ha, I'm better than you, or former me. We look down on the butt of a joke and by comparison, smugly perceive how different <laughs> we are from that person. Consider laughing at someone who slips on a banana peel. Maybe we laugh because we presume we're better than them. After all, we have never slipped on pieces of fruit. Indeed, the extensive use of this example seems disproportionate to its occurrence in reality. Even though this example is central for Henri Bergson and makes it into just about every analysis of humor, including this one, this has probably not happened that often in the history of humanity or in the ape world, where bananas are notoriously appealing. Note what just happened there is called a pun sometimes deemed the lowest form of humor. But some puns can be fruitful, like that one. So clearly, I disagree. However, I might feel superior to all sorts of things, such as oysters, yet not laugh at them. Also, imagine Socrates, who is notoriously ugly, exclaiming to a group of people, I'm the most attractive man here. That's funny, but there's no obvious assertion of superiority. But imagine People Magazine's world's sexiest man saying that same thing. That's straightforward superiority and isn't very funny. This reveals for most scholars of humor that the superiority theory misses the mark. After all, sometimes things are funny without resulting from superiority, and some feelings of superiority don't make things funny. Laughter feels good. Maybe this is because laughing releases pent-up pressure. According to the relief theory of humor, venting nervous energy is the primary function of laughter. It releases the energy or emotions or thoughts which are deemed inappropriate or unnecessary. Consider an example from Sigmund Freud about a criminal who says, while being led to his execution on a Monday, well, this is a good beginning to the week. Here, tension is built up in the setup. We feel apprehension or pity for the criminal. When we recognize he's unconcerned about his state, that energy becomes excess and is released through laughter. The joking context offers cover to express ourselves about issues we might feel pressure to repress, like death or sex. Since we need not repress those urges here, the superfluous energy is released in laughter. But sometimes humor doesn't involve built up energy at all. Consider this joke from Stephen Wright. On the other hand, you have different fingers. There's no time to induce any sort of mental energy based on the setup of this joke. There's no time to build up any energy that needs to be released. It's funny independently of any pent up feelings. So the relief theory of humor can't account for this joke. According to the incongruity theory of humor, humor results from the sudden recognition of dissonance or incongruence where our expectations have prepared us for something completely different. The temporary confusion is replaced with humor when we reinterpret the setup and its relation to the punchline. Instead of confusion, there's a kind of resolution and our reward for getting it is humor. The element of surprise cannot be frightening or dangerous since these create negative emotions that block feelings of amusement. Finding the severed head of your favorite horse in your bed is incongruous <laughs> if you would laugh. Mere surprise is insufficient for humor Consider, the unfaithful artist heard his wife coming up the stairs. He said to his lover, quick, take off your clothes. On an immediate superficial reading, we are befuddled by his unexpected and incongruous request. But we can reinterpret the setup so it clicks. He's an artist painting her, and that sometimes happens in the nude. So the wife would suspect nothing. Many simple and amusing riddles rely upon similar forms of ambiguity, such as this. Why was six afraid of seven? because seven, eight, nine. We easily shift between the meaning of eight and the phonetically identical numeral eight and enjoy the alternating incongruous frames of reference. With humor, we undergo a psychological and conceptual shift from a serious state of perceiving and thinking about things that fit into our conceptual patterns to a non-serious state of being amused by some incongruity. When we are serious, we are worried when the world is inconsistent with how we expect it to be. 
When we are playful, the incongruities are enjoyable. This analysis offers the groundwork for an empirically based study into humor where the degree of incongruity can be tweaked within a laboratory setting, thereby increasing or decreasing the level of humor. While most current theorists lean towards some version of the incongruity theory, it has its limitations. The theory best applies to instances of humor that are clearly verbal, where ambiguity, for example, is most easily constructed. But not all humor is verbal. Also, we sometimes enjoy re-experiencing instances of humor, like re-watching a sitcom where our expectations are not violated. Indeed, we consciously anticipate the impending humor. Finally, the sense of incongruity is so broad, including dissonance, contradiction, outright absurdity, that it loses its meaning making the theory difficult to falsify. The concept of incongruity is so elastic that it can be expanded ad hoc to cover any instance of humor, even that which, on the face of it, does not appear to rely on incongruity as such. It's funny, none of these theories seem adequate. Perhaps a combination of these theories can explain what makes something funny. There is little consensus regarding which theory is best, but like most philosophical conundrums worth thinking about, this is not uncommon. The philosophy of humor relies on many other philosophical areas, including logic, philosophy of language, aesthetics, and others. And since humor and laughter are emotions and expressions present in every known society in every time period, it is no frivolous endeavor. Failure to find a complete account of what makes something funny might be because it's in the early stages of study, or maybe we just aren't in on the joke.